I'm going to introduce the next speaker. He was Mar Mario Toboso. Mario Toboso has a presentation. It's called Paradigms on Functional Diversity. And I'm sure that it will be a pleasure to listen to him because he is a person who knows a great deal about this uh, issue that will be addressed. And his CV, as it's so um, broad, I think that he can he, I asked him what, what's the most thing about him. And so he is a member of the Independent Living Forum since um, 2007. And he's a scientist. He has a degree from the Institute of Philosophy from the um, Higher um, Council for Science. He, he has a master in access to information technologies. And his main work is focused on the intersection between disability studies and science, technology, and social studies, a framework for new studies on science, technology, and diversity. The, he is mainly focused on studies on functional diversities, studies of uh, disability, focused to uh, functioning uh, of Marta Sen, and designing inclusive uh, settings and so we could say many more things, but truly I think that now we want to give Mario time to speak. This will be, mm, I've asked uh, everyone to keep to their timetable 40 minutes so that we will have five minutes in the end for a few questions, depending upon how time is going. We'll see if there, there will be time for one or two questions because we don't want to um, harm the, um, the next speaker. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for the presentation. Well, besides all the things that you've mentioned, I'm a member of the um, Forum for Independent Living. I work in the Higher uh, Scientific uh, Council. And I would like to thank the organization of this conference for having invited me. And this is the this is the issue that I'm going to refer to and that we will share. This is paradigms of functional diversity. What am I referring to with this? These are different um, ideas that I've been looking at and other people as well. And this is a research project from the National Project for Research and in Development. And we are studying the incidence of uh, abilities, setting, setting abilities up, and we want to see what this, this course is all about. And, and now we are going to go on to the issue concerning um, disability. I'm going to describe what you can see on this slide. This is a, the usual symbol of a person in a, in a wheelchair. Well, at the bottom of some stairs, and I hope that you'll be able to see these slides all right. And so what we see here is a situation which has two variables. The, we have the person's body and the, the stairs, the uh, milieu, the setting. And so I'm sure that you will recognize these symbols. This is the archaeology of models and discourse on disability. We see the explanation of what disability is all about. And these models have been this models, the uh, rehabilitation model, and this is this body needs to be rehabilitated, and this symbol as getting the person up out of the wheelchair, and the other one is the social model, and it focuses on the surroundings, as Huang Ho mentioned in his presentation, and. 
no se trata de rehabilitar tanto el cuerpo de la persona, sino well, de rehabilitar los entornos. Well, what we need to do is rehabilitate the surroundings more so than the body. And we have the medical model and the social model. We have some notes here, and these are practices and representations. Practices are things that are done in a discourse, and the representation would be image about persons with uh, um, disability and how they are perceived. And then also we have the um, practices of medicalization, paternalism, we have expert knowledge, institutionalization, rehabilitation of a person. And then here the representations would be um, um, an illness, dependence patient, the medical care objective and uh, a deficiency. And in social model, here we have the practices. It's, these, it's the demedicalization um, in favor of independent living, independence, deinstitutionalization, rehabilitation of society instead of the person. And representations, here we have the notion of capacity instead of an illness and autonomy, uh, independence instead of dependence, a person instead of patient, and civil rights, individual, and also we have the disability. And so now I'm going to refer to an important idea behind the social model. Because this idea is important. Uh, capacity is a social construction, but what idea was forgotten about with a social model or it wasn't that the idea of disability is this, is that it's also a social construction. We see it expressed here. And so capacities refer to the um, movements of the body in a dynamic relationship with one's surroundings in a given sociocultural context here, in the context that where we move about. So all capacities are defined and determined and made possible by our surroundings, and so that capacities are also built socially. What we are able to do in our societies, in our socio-cultural context, is different from what other people in other contexts will determine as capacities that can be mm, assessed. And so now we are speaking about regulations, because here when we speak about the fact that capacities and in a social uh, construction, we also speak about something that is normal, to walk on one's legs, to read with one's eyes, to be able to speak orally. These are our skills, capacities, or skills that bodies adapt to and surroundings adapt to. An idea that is highly relevant is this group of skills, uh, capacities, is um, an attribute uh, that is expressed materially and symbolically. We can also speak about surroundings, practices, and um, capacity building attitudes, all based on this social construction using a system considering capacities. And here when we speak about um, capacities, we can refer to this as a, we look at the body through this social construction of a, a group of capacities or skills. The skills that um, each body should have. If we look at the body through this glance, we see that we are be speaking about skills. And then our first step to, we have to consider a group of capacities or skills that are inherent to the body. They don't come from the environment, but they come from the body itself. And here, this is a discourse based on representations, practices, values, and environments that participate in the production and reproduction of this privileged body of skills or capacities as uh, something that is normal. And also we have this, these abilities, these capacities, these abilities, then here, this is tightly linked to um, one's abilities. This is a normal discourse, but it goes further, it, that the group, when we speak about 
capacities or attitudes or abilities is the only way to work. It, it's not just enough to say there are groups of abilities, there's just one, and in accordance with this regulation, this is what we will remember. Here are some pictures which represent this um, ability idea. Here's a, a boy in his wheelchair. His arms are on the wheels, and he looked very fatigued. He's trying hard to move. He's next to a wall, and this wall projects his, his shadow, but not a, as a person in a wheelchair, but he is standing up with his arms uh, open. He seems to be very cheerful and happy. Notice his, his arms are in the air. He's completely free. I'm describing this for those of you who cannot see my slide. And this received an award in a in the UNESCO competition, although it doesn't really seem to be too inclusive as far as I'm concerned. This also was awarded this image was, and I think this is terrible. I'm going to describe it for those of you who cannot see well. This is a girl in a wheelchair. Her backs are to us. We do not see her face. Her arms are, are down on, on her legs, and in front of her we see a mirror, and in that mirror this girl um, is, is standing up, and she is pregnant, and she is... Um, her arms are around her, her belly. We can see her picture in the mirror, and the landscape is, um, is kind of a, a barren one. It's uh, sad, it's black and white. It's, um, there's no one else around. There are clouds showing that they're uh, 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 showing foreboding and a, a storm that it's on its way this received a uh, an award in 2016 from the cerni women foundation it um it alters me it and the the other just both show examples of how this um uh, capabilities how and capacities how they arise and how people show us a reflection of my desire. Well, you have to think things more carefully. We, we see this type of um, attitude, and I think that something that we should think of something, uh, it's, it's better to think about functional diversity. This discourse is more open. And here we have the uh, proponents of this, of this concept, Manuel Lobato and Javier Romagnac, 2005. They launched this revolutionary idea called functional diversity, near term for the struggle for dignity and the diversity of the human being. And this was uh, looked at in the form of independent living. And in 2005 already, this term has been growing. I'm going to say concept, but it's not a term. It's an idea, a concept. The idea was growing. And it's true that there's political use of this as a term. But I'm interested in the idea and the concept and with regards to functional diversity. So here we have Manuel and Javier, 2005. They wrote this article. Also, I'd like to recuperate a friend of mine, Paco Guzman, who I was able to share research with him there at the um, Higher Council for Superior Scientific Studies, and he wrote a book called Functional Diversity Analysis Around the Proposal of a, a Change in Terminology for Disability. This is a recommendable chapter. You can find this on the Internet. It's called and the Digital Repository of the CSIC. And this chapter is very interesting, I believe. So how can one define functional diversity? I'm going to try, but I'm sure you can know it better than I, but it's a type of diversity that um, comes from considering all the different expressions con of different types of functioning. And so 
There are many alternatives, not just one. This is a discourse that is an open one. What is the problem? What is one of the problems that I find in the discourse and in the idea of functional diversity? It, there is no so social um, evaluation, other diversities, cultural, ethnic, ide ideological, religious, gender diversities. They are valuable and they are assessed in social terms, although I have my, um, my doubts about this. There, there's a time when this evaluation of diversity isn't really in vogue, but the fact is that to respect this type of diversity means to guarantee expression, cultural, ideological, gender, religious expression, and to the contrary, this is not socially valuable. Evalu one cannot evaluate that socially. So one doesn't think that this should be respected, so people don't think that this should be, that, that one doesn't really guarantee this idea of functional diversity for us. So we, ever since we're little and through images and pictures and, and so, so many different ways, well, I think that for the moment that this is a barrier that means that um, functional diversity isn't assessed socially. Now I shall refer to the study of, the, of, of, the study of functional diversity in different dimensions because I'm interested in this being taken seriously. People should no longer say, hey, functional diversity is a euphemism that you use to not use the word disability. It's not a, a euphemism. It's completely different than what disability is all about. And as discourse is completely different. So my interest as a scientist and an academician at the Institute for Philosophy is to invent, to create reasons and to do research on ideas and arguments so that People no longer say that this is a euphemism. And well, and then you think, well, we have a solid discourse on functional diversity so that people can no longer say that that this is a euphemism. So for the moment, what I've been doing is to look at different dimensions where functional diversity is a completely necessary concept and super important. The first dimension, and here I find this quite interesting to tell you that they go from the, the body, how we are as a body, the, and then the culture we belong to. So this, I'd like you to come with me to begin our journey. And here in the picture, here on the slides, we see different bodies in different colors, as if it were a rainbow of different bodies with different um, functions, a pregnant woman, an adult man who is normal, a person with a guide dog, a child, a woman, a person in a wheelchair, another child. Well, we see a mixture, a mixture of bodies in different colors and different ways to work. And on the bottom, we see the evolution of a person, in this case a male, how his body evolves throughout life. Since he's a baby crawling, he, he gets up and walks, he's a child, he grows a bit more, he's a teenager. He reaches adulthood, and these are different photographs of that person until that person is old. So what I'm trying to show you with these images, with this picture, is that we all have our own way of functioning, and Bodies vary, and everything varies throughout life, as you can see on, on the bottom here. And so I think that functional diversity is inherent to the human being. This is a, a diversity that we should have no doubt about. They are belong 
inter, intersocial, digamos, it's nuestra, something that's intersocial uh, with our um, coexistence, and as we see, bodies um, change with age. There's a second dimension, which is we leave our bodies and we go to surroundings, to the environment. I think it is important to underscore the role of functioning as a mediator between the body and our surroundings. And so this is what I mean when we speak about functioning. Here on this image, we see precisely what are we talking about? What is what is functioning? This functioning, this behavior. Well, here we have a person who is walking and towards stairs. The person will reach the stairs and will climb up the stairs. Or it might be unfavorable. We see a person in a wheelchair who is going to the same stairs, and so everything is disfavorable. But let us look at the surroundings. Instead of a stair, we have a ramp, and so this is um, favorable, favorable surroundings, and that person may um, go up that ramp. And this uh, surroundings here, this can happen to anybody, not just to people with functional diversity. It can happen to anybody. Anybody who goes to a country, they don't speak the language, so they um, have a disability to be able to speak with other people. So we sometimes these surroundings are hostile to anyone for whom they have not been um, considered. And there is another uh, issue. It's the difference between functioning and uh, 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 capacity or capability, ability here. So here we see the problem when we speak about capabilities and dis um, capacities. So it's not found either in the body or in the surrounding, but in the link between the body and the surroundings, so that when we speak about that capabilities are attributed to bodies, that such and such a body has so, such and such a capability, so it, the capability is sent out to the surroundings to be able to do things. Are you capable of going upstairs, for example? And under this attribution of a capability, a person says yes, and that person will say, well, if you're speaking about capabilities, well, no, I am not capable of going up those stairs. But of course, the problem of a capability here of a body is that if we go back to the idea of functional diversity and we look at all these bodies that we, we, we saw in the previous slide, when we think about things in terms of capability, well, many of these bodies will not fit in to this discourse concerning capability. So these will be bodies that will have a, a, a disability because this shows the difference between how fun between disability and functional diversity are different. So we have functional diversity. We see this representation over here. And when we say that bodies have capabilities, inherent capabilities, well, it turns out that functional diversity is lost. To impose a capability in this, it means that we are going against functional diversity. This is why I think that this is an idea we must fight against. And we should be in favor of another type of issue, not are you able to do such and such a thing because we are forgetting the influence of the surroundings, or do you think that the design of these surroundings is suitable for such and such a, a thing? We need to see the relationship of the body and the surroundings through the corresponding designs. Now let's go on to the third dimension 
dimension of functional diversity. This is the political dimension. And here we have Landon Winner. Landon Winner is a philosopher. He speaks, he's a professor in New York. He speaks, he teaches functional diversity to engineers because Langdon was at the Institute of Philosophy for some time, Paco Guzman, and I met him. We told him the idea about functional diversity and he thought it was marvelous. He's, uh, so, and it turns out that Langdon personally knows Robert. Uh, Robert uh, Moses in uh, bueno, en California. Del, del 1980, so in 1980, he wrote an article, Do Artifacts Have Politics? No so un, un some, he analyzed a network of bridges en, en las, en las que on the roadways Island, that go from Long Island claro, to the se, beaches. Se de, and so he realized, the first thing that struck me when I, uh, when I looked at these bridges is how low they are. Why are these bridges so low? So he looked into this, and the conclusion was that those they were divined by Robert Moses, and they were low so that the buses could not go under. In other words, the buses that the popular classes used. So if you had a car, your private car, those were the affluent people. And Moses didn't want popular people or big buses to take people to the beaches of Long Island. So he made sure that the bridges were low and the buses couldn't go under them. So this is um, how artifact, this is, do artifacts have politics? Well, with regards to this and tied into what I just mentioned, there, there's a similarity with this. Now on this slide, we see a huge staircase and you see a person in a wheelchair face, looking at that, uh, looking at those uh, stairs. So these are surroundings which mean that people cannot do anything. And so we have to look at politics with that. And this is politics by considering that the surroundings incorporate discourses, and these discourse refers to bodies and the functioning of people. And these, this discourse is basically based on, they, they, they exclude discourse which excludes these the ideologies of uh, about capacities and disabilities. This is an architectural barrier, as the Moses Bridges, and this, these stairs, and we see here on the next slide, how going up, it, a young man can walk up with no problem at all. And on the right-hand side, we see people for whom these stairs is an architectural barrier. We have a person in wheelchairs, a person with um, a suitcase, an older man with a cane, and a girl with a, um, a baby carriage. And so these people could never go up these stairs. Fortunately, those um, normal designs for quote-unquote standard people have changed over the time because of demands for accessibility. We've, now we've gone to universal design. We left behind um, standard designs. Of course, universal design is an ideal. Now, we, we try to take on board all of the functional needs, but it's sometimes not happening. And so design can, can be conceived as something that happens from the perfected of diversity. These lead to open designs. The next dimension that I'd like to establish uh, is the ethical dimension. It's a dimension that has to do with values. So we're going from politics to ethics. In other words, from practices to values. Now, something that to me is important is that we really need to make sure that functional diversity is understood because this is what this is where, is where the ethical dimension comes in, in into play. In other words, we're going from a simply ideas to practices. And we're not only talking about functional diversity. There, there are other values that we need to bring uh, into play as well, non-discrimination, equal opportunities, and things like that. And these are values. And from this ethical perspective or this ethical dimension, then we need to make sure 
that these values are prominent in society. And so, uh, now we're in the fifth dimension. We're close to the end of my intervention. We're talking about, uh, this is what I call my, the social dimension. And this has to do with how social or functional diversity is closely linked to Martinson's uh, and focus on capacities and functioning. Now, this is uh, uh, someone who try, was trying to, uh, we're talking about um, Amartya Sin. We're, so we're, and I think that the, his teachings have a lot to do with functional diversity. So when we talk about um, ca capacities, uh, this is a word I don't like. We're, this isn't, we're not talking about ability, we're talking about capability. And so we have a, a different nuance there, and uh, the and this uh, uh, Amartya Sen's focus, uh, well then, is related to human beings in different cultures. What he's talking about is. Uh, uh, those things that um, we believe are valuable to do and things that we can do, but this will depend on the culture, according to Marquis Sen. This will depend on lots of different things. But for, in order for us to do those things, then we need to be free to be do, to do them. For example, for me, if it's important to go to the movies and watch films, and I don't have an audio description of the films, then I'm really losing out. And so, uh, the way I'm functioning, then, well, I'm, I'm not really fulfilling the, my the things that I'd like to do, so I'm, uh, my capacity is limited. So, in other words, um, we're talking about the opportunities that people have to actually function as they want to function. There's something else that's important in Amartya Sen, and that's the series of capabilities. Now, we're not talking about ability again. Let's talk about capability, and, and um, Sen himself didn't like this um, uh, limited interpretation. So we're talking about all of uh, the situations, then uh, the series of functions, valuable functions that people actually undertake in their surroundings. So that's what we have to do is realize the value of the hu of human diversity. diversity. So we have to pay close attention to human diversity because it might lead to inequalities, inequalities in our environments, in our surroundings, and um, there might be ph um, physiological characteristics that create um, inequality. So when we, t we embrace human diversity, as Martia Sen said, we have to pay closer attention to those situations which might lead to discrimination. And this is specifically where we see where functional diversity fits in, because Amartya Sen then talked about all the different types of differences among people, economic, social, physical. But often we don't take into account um, how we actually fulfill our functions. For example, we can move around with crutches, or we can move around in a wheelchair, or on our own two feet, etc. So we have to really uh, focus on functioning. In other words, in, in various articles, we have proposed uh, broadening the idea of of, of um, capacity or, or ableism so that we can move directly to the idea of the uh, functional diversity that our colleagues Iyati and Maniak have discussed. So we've gone from the physical, bodily dimension, we've gone to the political and ethical and social um, dimensions, and this brings us to the cultural dimension. So what do we find here? We find that, uh, that of course, each person and per so, um, then is, is part of a group, in other words, is to a certain extent extent, we can um, explain to our, our environments how we do things, what we need to do things. 
consider, que podemos considerar el and I think total here, if we look at all of our, the functions of people, that's part of the culture of the society that we belong to. In other words, here we have um, artistic or literary aspirations, but culture simply can refer to how we do things, and we each do things in a different way, and each person finds different solutions. So it's not only what our culture gives to us, but our culture is also what we do and what we ourselves give to our society. And so here we have the, uh, all of those functions, which in different environments, then, um, uh, then uh, allow us to do the things that we do. And the, and, and, uh, and of course, inclusive societies offer more opportunities for people to function within it. So here we have a brief summary of the things I've talked about. We have concentrated on, uh, on the concept of functional diversity. We've tried to explore it in different dimensions. So we go from our, our physical to cultural dimensions, going through relations, and politics, ethics, and social dimensions as well. And we have discussed how functional diversity is present there in each one of these different dimensions to talk about our reaction to our different situations. And we talk about um, strengthening our values within our society. And we've talked about the social dimension among others, and we've talked about the link between the idea of functional diversity and Martin Yassin's idea of functioning within um, our surroundings and our environments. And finally, as I say, we finished with the notion of the cultural dimension of functional diversity, which is linked to what we've just been talking about, how we ourselves create culture in the societies in which we participate in and the societies we belong to. Because if you look at our environments and our surroundings, then you bueno, pues see how we ourselves que, que are making contributions. So these are the things I wanted to tell you. My intention, as I stated at the beginning of my conference, was that I wanted to generate a deep discussion about uh, functional diversity, which will make it possible for us to analyze social uh, categories going from our bodies to our social environment and our culture, and to understand functional diversity as, as something transversal that affects each and every one of these dimensions of our human and social experiences. Thank you very much.